Chapter 6 Never had Sterling been so happy to see anyone. When she woke to the sound of snowmobiles, then had them come right to the cabin where she was standing in the doorway, she just about danced for joy despite her aching knee. Rescued at last. Miss Hawkins? The uniformed woman asked as she took off her helmet. Yes. Sterling wanted to cry in relief, but she held the tears back. That's me. Have you found Jake Ramsley? He set out yesterday morning for Earth's siding. Is he okay? We found him, came the curt reply. Will you be all right to ride on one of the snowmobiles? Otherwise we'll have to hook up a sled, and I'd prefer not to do that in the dark. I can ride, Sterling confirmed. Her reporter's sense kicked in to what the officer had said. Visions of them finding Jake half buried in a snowbank filled her with worry. You found Jake. Is he all right? Is he hurt? He's fine, the male snowmobiler said as he held out a gloved hand. Lenny Walsh. Sarah Hawkins. Sterling returned the handshake, relieved that Jake was really okay. This is Sheriff Terry Whittle. Lenny gestured to the woman who was pulling a bag of snowmobiler's gear out of a compartment. We've got some warmer clothes for you. Thank you, smiled Sterling. I cannot thank you both enough. You wouldn't happen to be one of the Terry Whittles from the Terry Whittle homestead mentioned on Mr. Waldo's map? asked Sterling. My parents still live there. The sheriff helped Sterling with the boots that they had brought along. Cold side road does not get plowed in the winter months, so I check on them weekly. I live in Carver's Bend. What happened to Earth's siding? wondered Sterling. Jake had been headed in that direction. Earth's siding is a ghost town. Shut down when the mining operation went bust twenty years ago. It was just not profitable anymore, so everyone moved away, explained Terry Whittle. That's too bad. Sterling zipped up the coat and put on her gloves. It happens to a lot of small towns based on one large company business. Sterling knew all about that. Her hometown was built around farming and one large employer who was struggling to keep its doors open. We can take you to Carver's Bend. I have Dark Luce waiting to examine your knee, said Terry Whittle. You should have examined Mr. Ramsley by now. Sterling nodded and accepted Lenny's arm to hop outside to the snowmobiles. Terry Whittle closed the door after them, and they were on their way through the falling snow, retracing the tracks back to the truck, then on to Carver's Bend. When they pulled up to the police station, Lenny and Terry Whittle helped Sterling out of the truck. She hopped into this warm building, happy to be someplace safe. Sterling looked around, but all she saw was a deputy, sourly typing with one finger at an ancient computer. Where is Jake? Sterling looked around, but did not see him. He left, the deputy supplied unhelpfully. Where did he go, Justin? Did Doc Luce take him to the clinic? Terry Whittle removed her gloves, tossing them on a desk. Mr. Rich Guy ordered a private helicopter to pick him up at the medevac site, shrugged Justin. He didn't even wait for Doc Luce. A helicopter? In this weather? frowned Terry Whittle. That is dangerous. I told him so, but he wouldn't listen. Said he had to get to New York, and he managed to hire someone to do it. Justin pulled out a pencil from behind his ear, tapping it on the desk. I drove him to the pad myself. He just left? Sterling was a little disappointed. She thought Jake would at least wait to see that she was safe before returning to his world. It had seemed like they had become friends during their ordeal of being stranded on the mountain. She ignored the little ache that his leaving left behind. Oh, he said something about how I could tell Sterling Denver that she was done messing with his family. Justin shook his head. I think being out in the cold has affected his brain. Who is Sterling Denver? questioned a confused Terry Whittle. She's some tabloid reporter from New York. Justin motioned to his computer. She writes for dubious. Sterling bit the inside of her cheek in an attempt not to react. Jake knew. He knew she was Sterling Denver, and he was not pleased at all. It sounded like he was very angry. While Sterling had anticipated a reaction like that when he found out, 
She did not think he might threaten her. Probably he would call her boss and try to have her reassigned to another department. Jake might even want to get her fired. Unless he bribed Grange with a lot of money, it would not happen. Even then, Grange was ordinary enough that he probably would enjoy Jake's anger and just goad him back, keeping Sterling firmly as the tabloid's feature writer. Sterling reflected that she had never felt bad about her job before. Even when she exaggerated, she had never outright lied in any of her articles. She had been doing everything she could to promote her career, just like all the writers in her field were doing. However, Sterling had made the Ramsley family one of her favorite targets, and Jake obviously did not approve. She did not need his approval, Sterling told herself firmly. She did not need him to like her. Just because they spent a few days together getting to know one another did not mean that they were friends for life. He was just someone she was writing about. Sterling told herself those lies, and a few others. Here's Doc Luce now. Terry Whittle introduced a little old man who carried a bag with him. He looked to be a hundred years old, but was competent in his tasks. Soon enough it was determined that Sterling should stay off her knee, and it should be examined more fully at the clinic when it opened tomorrow. Doc Luce felt that it was nothing more than a difficult sprain with bruising, but would feel more reassured in his diagnosis once Sterling had visited the clinic to have some tests done. With a room at a local bed and breakfast secured for the night, some donated clothes, and a cord to restore power to her phone, Sterling felt almost normal after carefully maneuvering in a hot shower. Elevating her leg on a pillow while reclining on the bed, Sterling looked at Dubious's website. Considering the remote location of the town, she was surprised at the download speed of the internet. Eligible bachelor and stunning tabloid writer still missing! Exclusive photos of Love Shack in a winter wonderland. Did the plane really crash, or is Jake Ramsley simply hiding away from his troubles with rumored girlfriend Sterling Denver? Is this how the famed reporter was able to build her career on the reputation of the Ramsley family? Sterling snapped her mouth shut and dialed her boss, Ray Grange. It took three tries on the smash screen, but the call went through. Ray Grange, dubious. Why not just call the tabloid Devious instead, hissed Sterling. Seriously, Grange, who did you let write that article? Faber? He's awful. Who is this? demanded Grange. Jake Ramsley's rumored girlfriend and your stunning tabloid writer, she said sarcastically. Using people for your own ends much? Hey, it sold copies, Grange defended his actions. You were nowhere to be found. You did not email any articles in. I had to print something. No wonder Jake Ramsley left like he did. Sterling blew out a breath and stared at the ceiling. You should expect a call from him, if he has not already invented his displeasure to you. Oh, I'm so frightened, scoffed Grange. I need more Ramsley material, so you'd better get writing. What did the two of you talk about the whole time out there? Make it suggestive. Readers want to know if he got in your pants. Sterling nearly choked. Nothing happened. Who cares? It's your word against his. Grange retorted snidely. Everyone is speculating anyway, so give them what they want. They're only speculating because of that article you put in the paper, growled Sterling. Jake Ramsley is a gentleman. He's a complete bore, but the public wants to know what he's like. We have to make him either loathsome or likable. Readers love a good romance gone wrong. Grange warmed to his subject. We'll say it was a whirlwind romance, like Stockholm Syndrome. Two people desperate to survive, but uncertain they would. I doubt he had any condoms, so we can claim uncertainty about a pregnancy. It would help if we can get pictures of you outside a doctor's clinic in a few weeks, or buying one of those little tests from the pharmacy. You are absolutely despicable, gasped Sterling. I am not going to drag Jake through a pretend pregnancy alarm just for the sake of Dubious's readership numbers. If you want to keep your job, I would rethink that, replied Grange. It hurts you nothing and is worth a pretty bonus. I'm low on battery. I can't hear what you just said, Sterling yelled into the phone before hanging up. 
she laid back and contemplated her life. She would have to figure out a way to smoothly maneuver Grange from this sort of article. Maybe if she got the lawyers from the ground floor involved, they could convince Grange that it was too much risk for a lawsuit. If not, she might have to dangle something juicier for him to follow. The trouble was, she was not certain if she had enough information to make that happen. Her contact at Ramsey Pharma had not gotten back to her yet. She might not be able to convince Grange not to run articles using her as a foil against Jake Ramsley. Sterling needed her job. If it came down to it, she knew she probably would have to pose for the pictures unless she found a job at another tabloid. She had an offer recently, but it did not pay as much as Dubious did. Jake would hate her even more than he did now if she did do what Grange wanted. Professionally, she should not have been bothered by the thought. Personally, she was depressed by it. When had Jake Ramsley become so important to her? Sterling tried not to think about it during a nearly sleepless night. Jake tried not to think about Sarah Hawkins, a.k.a. Sterling Denver, during a nearly sleepless night. How stupid he felt for offering her a job, for thinking about asking her for her phone number for kissing her. She probably had been laughing at him the whole time, thinking about her next headline. Miraculously, he only had a mild case of frostbite on his feet. Mostly his toes were affected. Jake otherwise was in very good health considering the ordeal that they had been through. He also had two cracked ribs and would have to be careful with them. Jake had some bruises here and there, but was overall okay. His heart and his ego were significantly bruised. He was a sucker, Jake thought grimly. She had lied, forged documents, bribed her way onto his private hired flight, and somehow gotten under his skin with her smiles and good humor over their situation. Sure, she had good humor, Jake supposed sourly. The whole experience was good fodder for her articles. She was probably writing stories about him right now, like that one he saw earlier today. Eligible bachelor and stunning tabloid writer still missing. The article was a pack of lies, making it seem like the two of them had been having an affair. It painted him as a man who was escaping from his responsibilities to enjoy a weekend away with his mistress. Anger flooded him that he could have been so blind to Sarah's true nature. Sterling, he reminded himself. Her name was Sterling. She was a tabloid reporter. Well, he was sick about her writing about his family. Jake was not going to let Dubious do this to them again. Sterling Denver was done. He would see to that. Flicking on a light, Jake sat up and grabbed his new cell phone. Brandon, give me my lawyers. Within minutes, his PA had roused Jake's usual team of lawyers. Two hours later, Jake had smoothed out the legalities of what he wanted done and had his team moving forward on a deal that Dubious would not be able to refuse. He also had his assistant sending out to all the contacts they had in the press and publishing industries. By the time they were done, Jake was satisfied in his revenge against Sterling. At least, that was what he told himself as he stretched out again on the hotel bed. He could have stayed with Dylan. His brother would have been happy to have him, as would his nephews. Jake did not get to see them as often as he would like. He really should make more of an effort to be in their lives. He had yet to really get to know Dylan's new wife and stepson. Jake would make sure that he took some time to visit, even though much of his and Dylan's time would be concentrated on trying to find out more about the charges being brought against their father and their cousin Michael. Jake puzzled over Michael's involvement in the drug smuggling charges. He never would have thought for a moment that Michael would have done something illegal. He was a lawyer. Michael was now a family man. Then again, the drug smuggling operation was purported to extend just over 30 years ago. Michael would have been in his 20s, younger and more prone to making a bad decision that could see him locked into a bad situation over the years. It still did not make sense to Jake. If Michael was truly involved, he was one cool customer about the whole thing. No one who knew him would have guessed. Now when his Uncle David had been arrested, Jake had not been surprised a bit. 
David had always been a self-serving bully of a man. Jake could believe that David would do whatever he wanted, regardless of the consequences. David gave off an aura of a king who was certain he would never be dethroned, nor did he have to bow to the rules of mere mortals. It was only through the interference of their mother Rachel and all the other family members that Michael had turned out well. Michael and cousins, in turn, had influenced Noah and Max to become decent men. Jake supposed that was why it did not mesh well in his mind. Michael had always been one of the cousins who always took the moral high ground. He had instructed the younger cousins again and again on doing the right thing, in his own kind and quiet manner. Michael took after his mother with a gentle reprimand and soft praise. Had David bullied Michael to become involved in something illegal? Was Michael covering for his father? From what the paper said, David had agreed to testify against Michael and Jake's father, Robert, in return for immunity in the case. How was it that the man who seemed the guiltiest was getting away with the crime? Uncertainty filled him at the thought of his father, Robert. Jake did not know why Robert would not talk to Dylan about what was happening. Robert was willing to speak to Jake, and they had arranged a time. Had Robert really helped smuggle drugs into the country? Jake did not know. He always felt that his dad was above reproach. Robert had been his example throughout life, a hard-working man who was dedicated to his family. For the first time in his life, Jake did not have faith in the actions of his father. It worried him. Not what might happen to the companies, Ramsley Farmer and Ramsley Insurance. Jake was worried what it might do to their families. He looked up at the ceiling and mulled over what a mess life had become. After a visit to the clinic, Doc Luce declared that it was just as he had originally diagnosed. Sterling's knee was badly sprained, and she would need to stay off it for a few weeks. She was fitted with a pair of crutches. Sterling thanked the doctor and his staff of one nurse for their help. The sun was finally shining. Sterling managed to arrange transportation to the nearest airport where she could get a flight back to New York. If everything went smoothly, she might even make it in for work today for an hour. She was looking forward to having it out with Grange about this morning's article. Tabloid star heartbroken after Jake Ramsley leaves her. Injured and left behind in a tiny hillside community, Sterling Denver was heartbroken after her lover callously left her behind as he fled to New York to deal with the continuing family drama. It was a subpar heading. It made her look foolish and Jake seem unfeeling. The papers had also begun to report that David was free in return for testifying against his son and brother. The whole thing stank. Sterling wondered why the FBI did not seem to recognize that. She continued to email her contacts and ask for more information regarding the case. A text came back from one of her sources. Anne in labor at Mercy. Private suite. Doctors hoping to prevent early birth. Maybe Sterling could distract Grange with this. Put forward the tragedy of Anne and Michael's current predicament rather than this bogus story of Sterling and Jake being a couple. The idea left a bad taste in Sterling's mouth, but she could not afford to have a conscience about it, she reminded herself. Her job depended on it. When she landed in New York, Sterling went straight to the mall to get a new phone. The salesperson managed to salvage all her contact information and files from her broken phone and have them transferred to the new one. Sterling breathed a sigh of relief. That information was her income, and she was grateful to have it back in a working phone. She grabbed some money at an ATM for the taxi ride dubious. Grange had to give her that bonus. She deserved it after all that she had been through trying to get the story on Jake Ramsley. Look how that had backfired. Sterling shook away the thought and the pain left from the hole in her life that Jake Ramsley had left behind. It didn't matter. She had not expected their friendship to continue. How could it? He had been friends with Sarah Hawkins, not Sterling Denver. The whole thing had been doomed from the start. All he was meant to be was a target for her pen, and she could not forget that. It didn't matter if she became attached to him, even liked him. Her job was to provide an entertaining story. 
She could not afford to become choosy and not run a good story just because she had come to respect and like the guy the story was about. As she maneuvered her crutches across the floor at Dubious, Sterling noticed that the building was unusually quiet, even for a Saturday when they normally ran with half staff. She wondered if everyone was at a meeting. It was so eerily silent. Grange's secretary was not at her usual post. Most of the lights were off. Chairs were empty. What had happened? Frowning, Sterling tapped on Grange's door, relieved to find him in his office. Grange had a banker's box and was stowing his framed awards in it. What is going on? Sterling tried to joke. Did the whole department get a pink slip? Grange scowled at her. You, you are the cause of all this. Excuse me? Sterling was surprised at the venom in Grange's voice. Because of you and those Ramsley articles you wrote, we've been shut down. Grange pulled another award off the wall, shoving it into the box. Excuse me? Sterling watched him in confusion. You told me to write about the Ramsley family. This was all done under your direction. You said it was boosting sales of Dubious. Jake Ramsley bought out Dubious and shut it down, taking the loss, growled Grange. He gave us all severance packages and turned us out. What? Sterling felt like the world was tilting. Taking a deep breath, she tried to get her equilibrium back. He can't just do that, can he? Grange snorted. He did. That's what you can do when you're a billionaire. You snap your fingers and everyone just gives you what you want. Why? Why did he shut down the paper? Sterling leaned heavily on her crutches, trying to make sense of it. Sure, Jake would have been furious to find out that she was Sterling Denver. But to buy an entire paper and shut it down? That was a bit overkill. I guess he hated what we wrote, came the sarcastic reply from her former boss. Moreover, he hates you. What? A pit formed in Sterling's stomach. Grange smiled maliciously. The rest of us got severance. You, however, have been fired. Terminated with cause. I have your papers here. Sterling automatically took the papers, looking down at them in shock. It was right there. She was fired and would not receive a severance package. Her last paycheck was there, but that was all. Sterling had gambled everything she had in her bank account for the last month on the hopes of creating lucrative articles for dubious about Jake Ramsley, and now that opportunity was gone. All she had was her paycheck in her hand, and it was puny compared to what she had lost. For a moment she felt a little light-headed. I need to sit down. If you're going to faint, do it somewhere else, Grange was surly as he pulled down another award. We have to leave the building vacant in the next hour so the real estate guys can come in to survey it. It's to be sold? Sterling did not feel like she was keeping up in the conversation, which was abnormal for her. It was like she was in some sort of surreal daze. You think Jake Ramsley wants to run a rag paper? He snorted in disbelief. By the way, I feel like I should tell you, since you've worked here for the past ten years, you're not going to get another writing job in the industry. Of course I will get another job. Sterling propped her crutches against the wall and took a seat. Her knee was aching. I'm one of your top writers. I'm practically a brand name. You are blacklisted, courtesy of the Ramsleys. Grange explained with some satisfaction. He never liked that Sterling had turned him down the many times he had asked her out. Never mind, it would have been unethical as her superior to hit on her. You must have done something to make Jake Ramsley put in the effort, but he's made you persona non grata for the entire news industry. No tabloid, newspaper, blog, publishing house, or anyone of any standing is going to publish your written word anytime soon. Good luck, Sterling. You are done. You're wrong. Sterling breathed. He had to be. It just had to be Grange talking big because he was mad about the paper being shut down. Jake would not have gone through the trouble to see her blacklisted, would he? Surely it had not been that big of a crime to write a few articles and publish some pictures. Grange just laughed. Sterling grabbed her crutches, 
hopping out of Grange's office as his laughter followed her. He had to be wrong. This was ridiculous. She had just been doing her job. Yes, Jake should be mad at her for lying and saying she was a flight attendant when she was not. That she could understand. Yet buying dubious, firing her, shutting it down, blacklisting her? That was crazy. Just because he had a lot of money and was angry at her did not mean he had to destroy her livelihood. Assuring herself that Grage was wrong about the blacklisting, Sterling grabbed a cab and went to Dubious's competitor, Vague. Two months ago, she had a job offer from Vague. Unfortunately, the terms were not more favorable than Dubious, so she had turned it down at the time. Perhaps they would consider extending the offer again. A half hour later, Sterling was back on the street. This time she sat at a nearby cafe, calling every tabloid and newspaper that she could think of in the city, asking for an interview. Then she called other tabloids in other major city centers. They all declined. It was very polite. Yet, whereas she had been in demand only a couple months earlier, now she was gently shunned. Most expressed their regrets that they could just not hire her at this time. Sterling started asking them when it would be a more convenient time for them to hire her. They just could not say. She was indeed being blacklisted. Next, Sterling went through every publishing agent she could think of that had contacts in the city. She had been approached not a week ago by an agent from a large publishing house to do a book deal. Sterling had wanted to have the contract looked over by a lawyer before making any moves on the deal. Now, when she called the agent... She was told she was no longer being considered for a book promotion and that the contract was being withdrawn. No one wanted to work with Sterling Denver. The more Sterling thought about it, the angrier she became. She was doing her job, and now she was shut out of an entire industry. The pen name, Sterling Denver, had been a brand that she had built up painstakingly for ten years. She came so close to cashing in on it with big-ticket items like book deals and possibly speaking tours. Now it was nothing. It was all Jake Ramsley's fault. He overreacted like some child who no longer wanted to play with a friend because that friend had said something that made him uncomfortable. Stomping in anger as best as she could on her crutches, Sterling got a cab. It was going to be horridly expensive but it was the quickest way to Dylan Ramsley's estate. She believed that Jake would be staying with his brother, or at the very least, Dylan would know what hotel Jake had chosen to stay at. Either way, she was determined to confront Jake about his bullying her out of a job. He was not going to get away with this. She would not let him. Stewing in the cab, Sterling built up her anger and self-righteousness. How dare he? How dare you? Sterling shouted into the intercom as she pressed the button at the gate of Dylan Ramsley's home. She leaned on her crutches to keep the button pressed as the cabbie waited patiently through her tirade. You bully! You insecure triarant! Oppressor of the people just trying to do their job! You think you can dictate an entire industry to keep me unemployed? You are the worst person on the planet, Jake Ramsley. How dare you have me blacklisted for doing my job! The only thing you have to be mad about is that I lied to you about being a flight attendant. That is it. That is my crime. Otherwise, I do what every other press person does. Invade a small portion of your privacy to create an article for a curious public. I never once lied in any of my articles. Embellish the truth a little, sure. If you kill the career of everyone who lies about you just a little, I can't believe what you would do to someone who dare do worse to your majesty. Just because someone chooses to do something that you don't like, you destroy them professionally? Not only can I not get a job in this city, I can't seem to find anyone willing to interview me for any other city either. Real mature, Jake. Um, Jake is not here right now? An embarrassed Dylan said when Sterling finally ran out of breath and released the intercom button. Fine! Tell me where that crustacean is, she growled. No, wait! Crustacean is too good of a word for him. He is mud. No, muck, from a dung heap. What is the scientific word for that? I would not know, Dylan said faintly. 
You don't know what the scientific word would be, or you don't know where Jake is? demanded Sterling. Neither? Dylan's voice was tentative. I'm guessing you are a reporter. Sterling Denver, Sterling confirmed with a huff. Although my pen name is now completely shot, so I suppose she no longer exists except in tabloid history. Suddenly, tears came to Sterling's eyes, and she blinked them away furiously. Ten years of work completely blown by one angry man with a vendetta. This was not just about Sterling. It was about so much more, and now her life was in ruins because of Jake Ramsley. People were depending on her income, and now she was jobless for the foreseeable future. You were on the mountain with him when the plane crashed, Dylan clued in. Look, Miss Denver, I don't know what happened or did not happen out on that mountain, but Jake certainly has not been in a good mood since. Not been in a good mood? yelled Sterling. He just destroyed my life and two hundred other people's. I thought Dubious had a much larger staff, Dylan wondered aloud. He's just destroyed an entire town, Sterling whispered as the enormity of their situation sunk in. Jake Ramsley had no idea what he had done. Excuse me? Dylan was obviously confused. All the fight left Sterling. Now she had to explain to her parents what had happened. She had to explain why there would be no money coming in this month. There would be a domino effect of consequences. It was all her fault. She had overreached. If Sterling had not gotten on the plane, she would have the money for her share of the mortgage and loan payments. They were already on final notice with the bank. It was all about to come crashing down. All because she had wanted to push her career even higher, knowing that she needed to push for more money to keep things afloat, to try to get out of the ever-climbing, higher burden of debt. Now she had blown it. She was on Jake Ramsley's bad side, and everyone she held dear would reap the consequences. A sick, heavy feeling invaded her abdomen. Everything was over. Sterling cleared her throat. I'm sorry, Mr. Ramsley. My tirade was directed at your brother, not you. She didn't wait for his reply, crutching her way over to the taxi. It was time to make arrangements to go home with her tail tucked between her legs. Never had Sterling felt worse in her life. How was she going to let an entire town know that she had let them down? If you enjoyed this chapter of Stranded with a Billionaire, book six of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for the next chapter. Also remember the books are available on Amazon. Just go type in Josephine Beintma and the Ramsley Brothers series and you'll find them there. Consider sharing this video. This is free for you to do and would help me with the algorithms. Happy listening!